Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. One of the concerns and one of the priorities for All Things LGBTQ Plus is we don't talk about our own history. And if we're not talking about it, other people don't know about it. And so thank you to today's guest because they are an archeologist and historian who have been, has been documenting the LGBTQ plus history in Vermont and in New Hampshire, and most recently was involved in the phenomenal project to talk about St. Andrew's Inn. So please welcome Gail Golick. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to, any anytime I can talk about Andrew's Inn, uh, I'm, I'm happy to show up and do it, so. <laughs> and, and anytime there's somebody who, who can talk about New England queer history, I wanna hear it. And, and as we start talking more about your interviewing process at St. Andrew's Inn, some of that will become more readily apparent. But first, let's talk a little bit about you. I mean, my understanding from what I read is you were, you are from Walpole, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. which is right across the river from Bellows Falls and, and it might as well be one community. Yeah. So tell me about being an archeologist and historian. It's, uh, it's something that I, I think people always will ask, how did you get involved in that and why, what, what kind of work do you do? And I, I, it's one of those things that I think my, one of my earliest memories being a little, a little history nerd watching PBS documentaries and finding out that that was a job you could do like an archeologist. Well, that's, that sounded like everything I've ever I had ever wanted. It was history. It was digging in the dirt. It was finding uh, learning about learning about things that I didn't know anything about and solving solving puzzles and riddles and things like that. And I just found a way to make it happen. As I got older, I found a, a school to go to and I learned how to how to, to how to do field work, actually going out and digging. And uh, and then when I moved back after school and I started to do that professionally here in New Hampshire, Vermont, and have been doing that for for 20 years or more than 20 years at this point. So uh, so I've been travel, have gotten to know the area very well, traveled around mostly New Hampshire and Vermont and gotten to work on some really cool sites and, uh, and have, I've just, you know, enjoyed it. It's, it's something you, you can never really get away from. It just, it's just part of who, one of those jobs is who you are kind of person. Yeah. And you have an ongoing podcast, The Secret Life of Death, which is looking at New Hampshire, Vermont, and some Massachusetts history by looking at our cemeteries. Yes. Yeah. So kind of one of the offshoots of, of the work as an archaeologist, I'm I'm always coming across these, you know, strange and interesting stories about little towns here and there. And I've always been interested in cemeteries and and just the a lot of a lot of it, and I'm sure I'll people who've who've driven anywhere in New Hampshire and Vermont, you'll be out in the middle of nowhere and you'll see a cemetery and there are no houses around. It's all grown up around you. And that had always been really fascinating to me. I was like, there used to be people here, obviously. So what happened to them all? And I I just naturally have been drawn to to learning about cemeteries and you can get so much so much uh, history about families and groups of people who used to live in a particular era for you know for sometimes a long period of time, sometimes a short period of time, and and you can use that as a microcosm to study all sorts of different things like you know women's issues and social issues and uh, poverty and and migration and and technology innovations and things like that can just you can talk about that through the lens. Of, of historic cemeteries and uh because it's it's sort of equal opportunity everybody has to die and go somewhere so <laughs> you find them one way or another <laughs> well that's very true okay so 
you would go into a cemetery, you look around, you see something that piques your interest and then you start investigating it? Yeah, m most of the oh. time that's that's how it goes. Be, one of my favorite activities is to just go for a drive and see what I find. And uh, and going into a cemetery, it might be the shape of a, of a stone is kind of unique or different, or the, the carving is a little bit unique or different, or the names, sometimes the names can just pique my interest, something about it. And so that, that will, I'll take that little nugget home with me and start to do some research when I get back. And sometimes it does, you know, sometimes it doesn't really go anywhere, but, um, but a lot of times it it the the story reveals itself as to to what what it wants to show me and uh so i can i can follow follow it down all sorts of rabbit holes and and discover discover the thing like i said discover all the stuff i never even knew i didn't know and just see what happens with the, with the research in the podcast uh i try to tell those stories and usually it's 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 about regular people it's not about the rich people the fancy people that we all see in you know in the history books in our town histories especially very very well represented i'm more interested in the people we don't know a lot about and cemeteries are some of the only places you might ever see their name written anywhere you know something like that it's very very evocative to me that idea so if i were to wander into a cemetery and see something of interest is that something that you might welcome saying, ooh, this might be a new avenue to explore or a new story to tell? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just keep, I just keep an open mind. And and again, it's, you know, I don't always find something. Sometimes it's, you know, pretty standard stuff. After you've seen one, you've seen a lot of them. <laughs> but the, but everyone, you know, there's, there's usually, there's usually a little nugget that I take away and then, and I might plug it in somewhere else later on. It might, it might not be immediately uh, appropriate for anything I'm working on, but I'll, I'll keep it in the back of my mind. And it always has a place somewhere in, in some of the work that I do. All right. So as I I've sort of veered off to a side here, coming back, coming back to talking about St. Andrew's Inn and, and the incredible research that I've seen that you've been involved with documenting its history. Look at, and, and there are, are lots of things to sort of put into perspective, you know, what Bellows Falls was like as a community, how the hotel in was originally created and how St. Andrews came out of that. So could you start by telling us what got your interest for doing St. Andrews in and what it is that you learned? Oh, well, uh, it's it's a local story, which are are always my favorites. And because I did grow up like most people who live on in our river communities on New Hampshire, Vermont side, like you said, it's they're really usually the same community just across the river. So the fact that we were on one side really, you know, re really, really didn't matter. So most of my memories and, and family history actually takes place in Bellows Falls. And um, so it's you th you live in a place your whole life and you you hear stories and you hear about people and things and you think you know it and understand it. And yet, as I got older, uh, there was there had always been talk about Andrews Inn. It had just been this this thing that floated around that got mentioned or or you know a comment uh, was was thrown out here and there as a kid. I remember that. And as I got older and older, I realized that I didn't really know anything about it. And I thought that was really kind of bizarre because we we talk about the trains and we talk about uh, the mills and all sorts of this other history in Bellows Falls, very proud of it and, and you know, uh, talk about that quite a bit. And here was this, 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 this place that seemed to have some kind of presence to it, yet it had no place in our, in our history, our, you know, our, our verbal, our, our verbal history as we knew it and our, or our oral history. So I was like, well, why is that? That's that's kind of strange. And just started to talk to people, you know, my parents and friends and, and people who I knew who grew up there and, the, and they didn't really know anything about it either. So I'm like, oh, okay, I, I this is also kind of strange. So it, it that that whole thing just sent me 
down down the path of figuring out it, why do we not talk about it? Why don't why doesn't anybody around here know anything about it? And so what is the real story? What actually did happen? What is the history of this place? So there's there's a sort of dual history. There is what was originally established as the Wyndham Hotel, which had a hotel, a restaurant, which has a very old and long history. And then in 1973, there's this transition where the owner's son takes over managing the hotel and the restaurant portion. And, and that's when the story gets really interesting. So <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about John mm. and what John was up to? Uh, John, the John Moises is a fascinating person. Unfortunately, he has passed away, um, but he he looms looms large, obviously, in in the Andrews Inn uh, legacy. And just just briefly, what had happened? His parents, uh, his father, his name was Andrew, so that's the name Andrews Inn comes from his father's name, Andrew. And he and his wife bought the Hotel Wyndham building, which is a huge building right in the center of downtown, right at the crossroads of the square in Bellows Falls. And it was opened as, like you said, a hotel restaurant, had always had storefronts on the first level and had always been a, a, a railroad hotel since it was built. And in the th in when they bought it in 1973, that was, that was their idea that they were just gonna open, keep it running as a hotel and a restaurant and just for the for the community in general a kind of a nicer place for people to go to have dinner cuz bellows falls didn't have nice places didn't have like nice sit down restaurants you had your diners and your bars and stuff like that but you didn't have places where you could actually go out for for a night and so that's what their idea was initially was to have a nice sit down place for people you could have your cocktails they had a dance floor you know make it a real night out sort of place but the but people in town really didn't respond the way they thought they they didn't want to stay they didn't want to go out in bellows falls if you went out you went somewhere else you went to some other place to go out and other people certainly weren't coming to bellows falls to go out because we had a reputation <laughs> back in the 70s you don't go to bellows falls <laughs> so the the moises family had a really hard time that first year of making a go of it because people just weren't coming into the restaurant and so their son john uh so franny or fanny and uh andreas or andrew the their parents um, their son, John was openly gay, John Moises, and he knew of a crowd who definitely wanted all of those things that they were offering, uh, the nice sit down meals, the places to have drinks, the places to have, have a dance floor. And they had the hotel also upstairs, which sort of contained in a safe space for, for queer people to, to go in, in a rural setting that just, you didn't have any options like that. And they they knew they were accepting of John and said, okay, let's do this. And so John had his contacts outside uh, outside of you know the people he knew in the cities. He knew who to send. Uh, they would send out little invitations to the you know the people they knew they could trust. And word of mouth really was the way it spread initially. And then eventually they they would put ads in some of the gay publications in the bigger cities. Uh, advertising party weekends up at Andrews Inn and primarily that's that's what their clientele was it was usually just weekend uh, weekend party um, parties and and that's that's pretty much what they what they catered to from then on you know during the week it, it was open to everybody it wasn't it wasn't that they didn't allow townies and and straight folks in or anything like that anymore but they certainly didn't turn away to the turn away uh the queer community on the weekends it was really for them on the weekends absolutely so th so the backdrop to all of this is that bellows falls is very similar to what people here in central vermont would recognize as sort of a berry type community that is a factory railroad mill type of community and if if i was seeing the transcription from your podcast correctly a lot of this 
was tolerated by the people in Bellows Falls, not necessarily because they were open and accepting it. It was because John was a townie. He right. was he was a local. Yeah. And there is, and, and and I would like you to share it, an incredible story on one of the podcasts about one of the local stores having a pajama sale and John's response and what he did. So yes, yeah, so the the Sam's Army and Navy, which was had been in Bell's Falls for years and years and years, every every year they'd have a, like a fifteen percent off sale if you came dressed in your pajamas, you know, sort of a gimmick to get people to come in and do some shopping, and and it, and as you said, John John was just he was himself. He always and he always was. My my mom and my uncles all went to school with him, and they just they always remember him. In those days, they wouldn't have said, you know, he was gay, but everybody knew what that he, he that's how he was comfortable. That's how he presented. And he never pretended not to be even even in the 50s, in the 60s. And so he he had it. He had he put on his uh, silk pajama or either silk or satin. I think maybe it was satin, red satin pajamas with a, you know, like a, with a with a, I don't know if it was a kimono or not, but it had a hood or something like that, um, you know, um, bathrobe and his slippers. And he walked across the street and he went in and got his 15% off and everybody was so worried about him. And, you know, he got hooted and hollered at as he went across the street, I'm sure. But uh, he got his, he proudly got his 15% off of whatever he bought and uh, went back and was, you know, unscathed physically anyway. And, you know, to prove a point because he had, he had the cachet as, as a local, like you said, he was a townie, people knew him and he also didn't put up with, put up with it either. He gave as, as well as, you know, he, as they, as they gave back to him and he didn't back down when people gave him a hard time about who he was. I was going to say, as part of that story, it goes into a narrative about John just being clear, this is who I am, and that when the trucks would go by whooping and hollering, he'd yell at the trucks, why don't you stop right here and I'll go upstairs and get your daddy to come to go home with you. Perfect comment. Now, <laughs> there came a point at which they sold the business. Yes. And... Although the town had tolerated it when it was one of our own, the people to whom the business got sold, at least initially, didn't have as warm a reception. Yes. Yeah. And, and in retrospect, all of this is happening in the early days of like gay liberation, which is also so fascinating you know, they didn't know it was coming. <laughs> so they're just, you know, they're going for it. They're seeing these opportunities and like, yeah, we can do something for our community and be part of this. And we see so much opportunity and potential here. And, and so the bit, the business was making money. They were, they were having a, a steady stream of people coming up from the cities uh, weekend after weekend. And so they were prepared to sell the business because it was, it was actually uh, turning a profit for them. And they got uh, a, so, uh, a couple who were interested in buying the business, uh, Tom Herman and Jeremy Yost, and they were a couple from New Hampshire. And New Englanders, being the the strange characters that they are, like they were they were from New Hampshire, but they weren't you know from here. Like they were still New Englanders, but they weren't from here. And that somehow may I mean nominally that's what 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 people worried about they were outsiders but you know it's like this coded thing they were a same-sex couple at the time which and again openly so and that was a, a bridge too far for a lot of local people when that happened then it was a little more xenophobic and outsiders and they're talking about you know people invest out from outside investing in our community and now what's going to happen because this are, these aren't local people we don't know these we we don't know this family or these people and before it was a family john's parents owned the business and that seemed to be one thing that people could kind of be like well okay they're just letting him do john do this thing but they're they're the adults and they're keeping you know keeping tabs on on everything but when the the Moises family 
were ready to sell. And these uh, outsiders, these new people that they didn't know wanted to come in, it, it started to set off a lot of, uh, a, a lot of worry for a lot of local people who just didn't have that kind of exposure to to the queer community and saw this very as a very person like actual language they're using is like they're coming here they're they're trying to you know infiltrate they're trying to take over our community like the same sorts of things we're hearing nowadays you know and uh without really ever finding, getting the, the real story or before they even got to know them or even met them. That was the narrative that was being, uh, that was being thrown around. And there was a protest the day that their, the sale went through uh, for, for Tom and Jeremy. And they, they were, you know, the most exciting day of their life, you know, they're coming to take this, take over this business. And they're so happy in this small protest, but a protest of of concerned citizens uh, marched down the street and they were chanting slogans and they had signs and you know gays go away and things like that and religious groups sort of had caught wind that this was happening and they came to sing hymns and <laughs> it sort of uh it, it got blown way out of proportion and they were just shocked they they did not you know see that coming that was that was uh, I think in retrospect, they probably they feel like maybe oh yeah that can see where that would have been a lot, but uh, it it was it, it got blown out of proportion very quickly, and afterwards it seemed like it died down fairly quickly too. I think the locals also, to their credit, some of the other people were like, okay, that's not what we want to be doing either. This leave these people alone, let them run their business. Maybe you don't agree with what they do or how they do it, but they're not bothering anybody. Leave them alone. And there was a brief period where there was some degree of vandalism, but that also just sort of faded off as well. A little bit. I think there were the more people I've talked to, uh, which has been a wonderful thing. We keep running in to, to people who used to work there or used to go there and the more and more and we keep getting little stories. There were occasionally fist fights and, you know, the people getting drunk on the weekends and wanting to go start something. And so a lot of, you know, fist, you know, they get into fights outside and uh, a rock would get thrown through the window periodically. It just, that was, that just, you know, that sort of, but nothing, not a sustained assault on the place, but just always sort of a wariness that that's happening on that side of town and and people all knew about it and if you wanted to it was the low-hanging fruit probably for for a lot of the you know a lot of the hooligans in town to go and and feel like they could blow off some steam doing something slightly bad but not too bad by just breaking a window or something like that i was gonna say that that all sounds terribly familiar for new england factory mill town <laughs> of what yeah. what what you expect to hear about on Monday morning. Yeah. Now, there's also a conversation about a raid that happened mm -hmm. at one point and people's belief that it was something that was coordinated between the local police and federal agents. Can you, do you know what I'm referencing? Yes. Okay, could you talk a little bit about yeah. that? It's, it's really, it's, it's really too bad that that for a lot of reasons that it happened because the the inn continued along after Tom and Jeremy owned it and continued to do very well and was actually an important part of the downtown business it was an anchor business because they always had people coming from elsewhere coming in and would be in the downtown and when they had the party weekends they'd go to other you know they'd patronize other establishments in town so when they had had these weekends happen everybody, all the businesses in town benefited from it. And it was on that trajectory that the Moises family had started that it was a, it was, it was a good downtown, a solid downtown business. And, but, you know, you get, and, and, and it's one of those weird things where maybe they were too successful, maybe they felt too comfortable. And so that also rubs some people the wrong way and certainly did in, in this instance, if you have those prejudices <laughs> going into it, you're going to find a reason to, you know, to make, make something out of nothing. And what we were able to determine was that there was a, 
a business out, out of Boston that was called Club International. And they had their hand in a lot of pots. They, they were involved in organized crime down in Boston and drug running, uh, sex work down in Boston. And it was all part of part of this this network that extended all up and down the the eastern seaboard it wasn't just in boston either but part of their part of part of one of their businesses was was male prostitution taking johns outside from or taking them from the city and they'd go on you know weekend crew or weekend getaways or cruises outside of the city and they'd go to different places uh in the i91 corridor and not just fellows falls all sorts of places, but Bellas Falls was one of the stops that that some of these people made, and not and the Andrews Inn, as far as we could tell, was never actually one of them. But uh, they, I think, certain people in in the uh, in the establishment, the the police just assumed because you had a gay club that this is probably what was going on there as well, and never having talked to Tom or Jeremy, the owners, about any concerns they had. And it was always Tom and Jeremy always wanted to run a very upfront business because it wasn't a seedy nightclub. They didn't want it to be that. And the people who went there to the inn didn't want that either. That's specifically why they went there, because it was a quiet place where they could get together and be safe. And if you started to introduce that other element into it, it, some, it suddenly becomes something else very quickly. And, and that's not at all what they were about. And through... Other other people who had had ideas about uh, or, or were unhappy about the inn being where it was and being successful had connections to uh, to the uh, as informants to the bells or to the uh, Boston police and it served in in other capacities in other cases that concerned this club international sort of planted the seed that you know. We could have this. We could take care of this here. You know, we know this is happening here in Bellows Falls, and basically arranged to have have three uh, male sex workers show up at the inn one night in May of 1981, um, and or 1982 rather, and who had never been there before. Nobody knew who these guys were. This was the first time that they had ever showed up. Federal agents come in. And these guys proposition them and they get arrested and it all goes down unbeknownst to any really anybody who's actually in the inn. And uh, it, it's it's just this bizarre uh, turn of events that when you uh, and I, I put together the the whole chronology, talking to Tom and Jeremy, as well as some of the other people who were actually there that night and newspaper articles, the newspapers back in the day reported everything. Uh, the local papers were on top of this and got all the details. I mean, it is right there in all the newspapers of what, what happened. And it's, uh, and there was nothing to it, but of course that if people assumed that a gay club that, that, and yeah, of course there was sex going on in this club. Of course there was, <laughs> but, uh, the, it wasn't, it wasn't that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't this other element that they were insinuating that it was. But once the, you know, newspaper headlines was prostitution raid at Andrews Inn and, you know, it was, it was over from there on out. I, I was going to say, and St. Andrews closes in 1986. And, and I'm told that although our community may not be very familiar with St. Andrews history, the Vermont Historical Society did yes and there is now a plaque in front which has information recognizing the Wyndham hotel that also includes on one side the history of saint andrew's inn it does that it was uh in two th uh in late 20 2019 i think uh state historic preservation officer uh <laughs> excuse me they we're working with National Park Service to identify important LGBTQ plus sites in their states, uh, respective states, all the states, and they they decided that Andrews Inn should be part of the part of the ones. There's four recognized in Vermont, and the Inn was one that they recognized, and had a had had the fun historic marker put outside the green historic markers put outside the building, and 
talks about on one side of the marker talks about the history of of the actual hotel itself but then the other side is all about Andrews Inn and it its importance in in uh, LGBTQ plus history it was at I think at its time the only the only establishment in the state of Vermont uh, of its kind, maybe even, you know, maybe even between Vermont and New Hampshire, it might have been the only one. And so that's, it's remarkable that it happened and it happened in my backyard. <laughs> and, and, and we and we didn't really, you know, up until a few years ago, nobody's really talking about it that much. And it's, it's a unbelievable historical location. And with that, Thank you for spending this time with us. And I still intend on inviting you back to talk about LGBTQ plus history beyond St. Andrew's. Inn. <laughs> that will be our next project. So okay. thank you for this time. Thank you so much. This was great. I'm in, so uh, thrilled to share it with everyone who wants to hear about this place. So there's been a lot of conversation recently about Andrew's Inn and where it fit in Vermont queer history. And, you know, people have talked about the sort of background, the, the sort of historical demographics, but I really wanted to talk with people who had lived it. And what better people than the two people who are joining me tonight who for five years were the proprietors of the Andrews Inn. So please welcome Tom and Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. And okay, so I want to start out with mm -hmm. what was your life like before Andrews Inn? What, what was it that you were focusing on? And what did you think was going to be in your future. <laughs> Jeremy, do you want to talk about what our life was like before the Andrews Inn? And I'll take <laughs> yeah, it from okay. there. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we lived in a very rural town in southern New Hampshire called Richmond. And we had in 1974 on Valentine's Day closed on this small little cabin and two acres of land in a, a community, kind of a land trust. And it was very rural and it was the seventies and we were doing French intensive gardening and, you know, growing things. And um, I was cutting wood to heat the house, you know, seven or eight cords a year. And we had access to this 400 acre sort of trust property. So it was, um, and it was backed up by 6,000 acres. So for me, uh, it was ideal. I was in heaven <clears throat> and uh, wilderness everywhere, cutting wood and fixing up the house and putting on porches and different things like that. And we had, you know, several friends in the area. Um, it was about half hour from Keene. So if you wanted to do anything, you had to, you know, drive a half hour. I was just finishing up Keene State College. I graduated in 76. And then from there, um, well, there were many things, and Tom, maybe you want to talk about that. Um, but we, you know, we were kind of the the gay couple in Richmond, New Hampshire, that the fire chief really didn't like kind of thing. <laughs> I, it's always the fire chief. Why <laughs> is it the That's fire like chief? That. You know, I don't know. Okay. But it was yeah. definitely the fire chief. And he actually made it difficult for us in a number of different ways. Um, <clears throat> but then it was... Uh, you know, we working different jobs. I was working in in hospitals as a nurse at aide, and Tom had a bunch of you know businesses that was keeping us afloat. Um, and let's just say the house and two acres, um, we sold a sports car for the down payment. Okay, yeah, I got okay. a six hundred dollar Volkswagen Bug. I mean, the the property was twenty six thousand dollars. Back then. A very different time period. Yeah. What do so, you think? What did let, you me, think? let me take it from there as far as Good. how we proceeded. Were you complete? Yes. Okay. So in 1978, a friend of mine visited um, from Albany, and he had said that he had heard that there was a gay bar up in 
Bellows Falls. And so we took a trip up to Bellows Falls. I had never been in a gay bar. I don't drink and never did. And we took this trip up to Bellows Falls to see the Andrews Inn on a Friday night. And I was amazed and astounded and very interested in the whole thing and the fact that it was for sale. So to make a long story short, uh, we spent about a year trying to raise the money. We had $800 in the bank and we spent about a year to raise the money to be able to purchase the Andrews Inn. Um, for me, it was about a desire to live within our lifestyle and to see what we could do for our community. That was my interest um, because we were living in, as Jeremy said, very rural New Hampshire with a lack of much acceptance at all. And um, I wanted to see if we could do something that would be a little bit more supportive for us and for our community. So we did buy it. And the day we closed, there was a protest march down the center of town with bullhorns and get the fags out of town and all kinds of rabble rousing right in front of the building that we had just purchased. You see, the history is that the place had never been gay owned. It was a old couple who ran the diner in town and they had bought the Andrews Inn. And when it was failing, they had their son, who was courageous to do it, begin to run the weekends to try and make some money to keep it afloat. Um, and he had a lot of courage and pizzazz to be able to do it. But <laughs> they never, the town never rebelled against it, I think because his parents had been there so long and had run the diner so well for so many years. And we were outsiders, you know, we were the gay mafia. We were from who <laughs> knows where and what were we going to do? <clears throat> And so this was our welcome to Bellows Falls, which, of course, in those days we used to lovingly call Fellows Balls. So we we closed on the property. There we were. We had $3,000 worth of broken glass from rocks being thrown through the windows the first year we were there. We had bomb threats and fire threats, and I was punched and knocked down during those years. Um, it was an amazing thing. And, you know, I'll just say that for me, there were some wonderful moments, and I have some great stories I can tell about the amazing things that happened. But it's only been in this last period of time, with the help of H.B. Lazito and Susan McNeil and Gail Golick, that we've, I, for me personally, have begun to celebrate what we did and what it was all about and begin to heal from a lot of the trauma that was there. So I have some wonderful stories, but I want to give Jeremy a chance to speak too. Yeah. <clears throat> I was yeah. going to say that your your experience is not unusual being someone who grew up in Vermont and in a very small town. I appreciate that dichotomy of a community being very homophobic. But if you're one of their own, mm -hmm. there seems to be some kind of mm -hmm. exception that yes. that kicks in. And there's a greater level, I'm not going to say of acceptance, but of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And and there's there's more that that you can do. So I I want to know how you first and foremost, why did you stay? <laughs> and how did you overcome that? And were there things that happened that the community learned not to be afraid of you as much as they thought they should be? And part of the narrative around Andrews is, you know, I grew up in Plainfield. I didn't know you were there until much later in my life. You had a larger reputation outside of our community, our geographic community, than you did here. But Jeremy, what what do you have to share with us? Um, we had a lot of energy. <laughs> Tom especially had a lot of energy, and I think you know, in retrospect, for me, I was the the groundskeeper, the financial guy. The guy who talked to the hardware store owner down the street, um, I had a tool belt that I wore 
uh, every day to do all the electrical, plumbing. I mean, it was 25 rooms uh, and 50 many rooms. Right. I mean, it was 25 rooms of, of with bathrooms. And so it was it was 40,000 square feet. A huge endeavor, four storefronts. There were some immediate economic challenges. Oil went from 50 cents a gallon to a dollar a gallon. The liability, liquor law liability insurance went doubled to like to $5,000 a year. And um, the taxes, because, oh, we got some New Yorkers in here. Yeah, well, let's raise the taxes. The taxes doubled. So all the projections that I worked on with my accountant, um, you know, immediately it was like another $50,000 on the bottom line that we had to raise to make it happen. He was creative. I was persistent. Maybe <laughs> stubborn might be a better word. <laughs> <laughs> and I just did what I had to do. And Tom, you know, still to this day, I'm in so much awe and gratitude for a human being who is dedicated with every cell in his body to work on uplifting the community and the consciousness of the surrounding community. And the the environment, because I was used to, you know, I'm kind of a wilderness guy, as I indicated, I ended up only going Monday through Fridays. Sometimes I'd stay over, but the discotheque was right under our apartment. So it meant that thump, the thump, the thump, the thump would happen till two in the morning. And I quickly burned out on that um, and then focused my energy on what I could do, the skill sets that I had learned. Um, to keep the physical property running and to make it accommodated so that, you know, the four storefronts that we rented, we took over one of the stores um, and put in a big, it went through the brick wall and put in a, a door to the restaurant. We had a, that in-town restaurant and that all of those things required, you know, just ongoing projects, refrigerators that would die, compressors that would go down, uh, beer deliveries that didn't happen. I mean, it's really quite something. Um, and we, you know, I have to say this, that we had a vision. There was a vision. There was something bigger than us, I feel, that was pulling us forward. And it, it wasn't something I could identify consciously, but the energy that we needed and the, the mission, the vision was was so strong that we dedicated ourselves to it. And there were six, I think, major fires in the town in the first couple of years. Um, we watched all this downtown renovation taking place with the fires. The fish ladder came in. They were getting the salmon to come up the, the Connecticut River and the fish ladder was put in Bells Falls. I mean, there were just a lot of things that were taking place amongst all the, you know, the obvious social component of running a, you know, gay bar and hotel, um, which was a whole different thing. Now, the last thing I'll say is economics seems to lead people's hearts in many ways. And every time we had a special event weekend, the downtown would make many thousands of dollars, which very quickly became probably the biggest selling point for tolerating us and accepting us. So, Tom, in addition to bringing money in for the community, you you have some stories to share about events and experiences that are going to make me feel warm. <laughs> so to, the backstory of this one particular event is that many years before, when I came out to my family, I was told that I wasn't welcome in their home. So I want you to know that before I tell you the story of the Yellow Rose Ball. Mm. So in our restaurant, um, we had a young waitress who worked for us and unfortunately was killed in a car accident. And she was very fond of Yellow Roses. So we renamed the restaurant the Yellow Rose and we did throw an event and called it the Yellow Rose Ball to raise scholarship money in honor of this young waitress. And so one of my favorite memories to this day is that I was standing in the lobby where I would always stand to welcome and greet people. And I looked over to my left 
and my father, the doctor, was dancing with Brian Murphy, dressed as Pearl Bailey, who had performed for us. It was my father dancing with Pearl Bailey, Brian Murphy. And I looked over to my right, and there was my mother sitting at the pack machine talking about life with Glenn Hughes, who was one of the village people. So, and the music was going, and it was like people from the community, people from uh, our usual people who come to the bar, unbelievable mixture of folks. Mm -hmm. And it was just a delight and still is to me. I mean, there were many difficult, difficult times. I'll tell you one more quick story. I have two others, but I don't know if we have time. But one story I'll, re I'll say quickly is that one night, um, this group of young people came in the front door with baseball bats and angry and, you know, ready to do damage to whoever and to the place. And I just remember that the music stopped and all of the patronage sort of gathered around the steps going up to the discotheque. And our resident drag queen, Rodney, came in front of the group, looked at these young people and said to them, we don't bite, we suck. And all I know, they turned and walked out <laughs> the door. <laughs> oh my God, only a queen yes. could deliver oh, yeah. a line yes. like that. Exactly. And have <laughs> one more story and then I'll-, I'll Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So when we first came to town during that protest march, and I think there was this very tall young man who used to wear a leather vest with no shirt underneath. I hate fags on the back of it. and was intimidating. He was very big and he would harass our staff and, and me and all of us whenever we would venture out of the inn, either to go to the laundromat or to do whatever we wanted to do in town. And he was very, truly scary. Well, as it has it, as it had back then, his, I guess his probation officer was a dear friend of Jeremy and mine because we had run a group foster home for teenagers in years prior. And this man, the probation officer said to this young man, I think you ought to go in and talk to Tom. I think you'll find that Tom and Jeremy are tough people to hate. So to make a long, very long story short, this intimidating, huge guy came in, talked to me. I hired him as our bouncer. <laughs> so he worked for us as our bouncer for a while. And then the cherry <laughs> on the top of the cake is he was willing and entered the Mr. Gay New England contest to represent the Andrews Inn. And I drove him down to Rhode Island for the contest. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the most embarrassing moments of my life and probably his life was that this manager during the contest, they were all in their bathing suits, came up to us and looked at me and said, <laughs> you really ought to fluff him up a bit. And I turned bright red. He turned bright red. <laughs> he didn't win. And we laughed all the way back to Bellows Falls. Oh. So those are a few of the wonderful stories. <laughs> Okay, with stories like that, and, and sort of in the few minutes we have remaining, what made you decide it was time to close Andrew's Inn? Mm, yeah. Do you want Can to I just share that? one thing before? Oh. This is our <laughs> bar manager yeah, Roger. on a typical Saturday <laughs> night. Just to put a, a face to the Showtime. The story. Say, Showtime. Showtime. Yes. Anyway, it was a it's a combination of many factors. Um, remember that while we were running it, AIDS began to hit the foreground, and we were food service at a restaurant in the center of town. So all the misconceptions and misunderstandings were there. There had been an orchestrated raid on the place that had nothing to do with us, and we were found not guilty of any wrongdoing. But that hurt us dramatically financially, and I think the combination of um, I was burned out. I was exhausted. Uh, it hurt us financially, and it was very difficult to recover from it. And it was time. And those who were around us, the allies and folks who had helped us, we had many people contribute to help us buy the place financially, allies, gay, lesbian, all of the different letters that are possible. And they just said, just don't do this to yourself anymore. And it was time. Yeah to say we did what we could and it's time to move on. Yeah. But yeah. but you would do it again. 
<laughs> and, and and I say that because I know both of you since leaving Andrews and and what you were choosing to do in your lives now are both reaching out and healing and supporting people right. and mm -hmm. trying to help people move forward on their journey this and creating a safe space for that the same as you did with Andrews in yeah you know what it was another like? thing I might just say about it that that I think was a part of it that Tom and I realized was that, you know, in reality, 70, 75 percent of the revenue was being generated by alcohol sales. And neither of us drank or, you know, were alcoholics or anything. And I think over time, it just became a, a conflict of values. And both Tom and I, as you said, are, you know, kind of more on the healing path and helping people um, get out of the stuck places that they're in and realize who they really are and and hold them in love. And that there was there was the, the bar was still um, supporting a lot of people's addictions. Let me just put it that way. I was, was going to say, factor. you're giving voice to something that our communities have struggled with. Yes longer than than I care to acknowledge right. because a lot of our activities focus around a bar and there are all the issues that come with that. Right. So with that, I need to say thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for running Andrews in and definitely thank you for the work you're doing now. Yes, you're most welcome. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.